started, just to help everybody schedule, uh, we're pleased to have uh, our two of our legislators, well, I guess prohibiting our two legislators with us, uh, Mr. Spencer Eigel of some town outside of Grand Rapids. What is that called? Obama. 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 <laughs> okay. How many of you are aware of Obama? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. And Spencer is in his second term in the House of Representatives in St. Paul, though his first term representing him in the area there. And uh, also we have Senator Ralph Farnsworth of Hibby. Uh, he is in his first term in the State Senate. And they're going to start um, uh, this uh, legislator, legislate short, has been out of session since well, May 22nd. May 22nd. So, but they're prepared, they're spending time in the district, obviously finding out what concerns we might have, and they're preparing for the next session. So, I think they're going to talk a little bit about what they foresee happening in the session ahead, and then they'll entertain questions from you all. And being a small and relatively civil group, I don't think I need to moderate those questions. Just, just raise your hand, and they'll be able to answer them. If it gets a little rowdy, I'll come and try to moderate. Okay? Take it away, gentlemen. Sure. Well, um, Senator is always going for a house member. I'll point out that while I am in my first term and Spencer's in his second term, since Senators work twice as hard. It's really <laughs> 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 my second term. So, um, I'm going to be here for the invitation to be here today. Last year was the weirdest session in the history of our state, and I expect that this session coming up will be probably take second as far as the weirdest session. It should be a bonding, uh, primarily a bonding year, but there are so many problems with all of the bills that were passed last year that I think we're going to be doing a lot of cleanup on those bills uh, in addition to working on bonding. So I think it's going to be it's going to be probably another crazy session. Um, I've heard from a number of business owners about this safe and sick time that has just been an absolute nightmare. Even, even employers that already provide the sick time, all of you know the layers of paperwork and, and the mandates have made life difficult. I don't know if there's an appetite to even work on that um, with the majority, but that's definitely something that we're going to look at. Uh, paid family leave that sort of goes along with that doesn't take effect until 2026. But we're already 670 million over budget on that. So, and, and just to give you an idea, when that passed, it passed with a 0.7% tax. And we expect, and then I think in the bill that they were allowed to go up to as high as 1.5% without legislative approval. And we expect that they're going to go up to the 1.5% immediately because they've discovered this is costing twice as much as we thought it would. So, uh, speaking of costing twice as much as we thought it would, the free school lunch bill that was passed. They expected that would cost $212 million. The last number I heard is that that's $171 million over budget. It's almost double what they had allocated. And so having to take money from one pot to cover that affects, affects the whole budget. So all of these unintended consequences, and those are just a few of the examples. I'm sure that, that folks have specific questions. Um, those are just a few examples of the um, of the unintended consequences that we have to try and sort out. Hopefully there is the will on, on some of those to sort those out. And then bonding. Um, and of course, as, as you know me, we need bonding in our area. We were able to get, I think, on the B side of my district, around 32 million, or the A side of my district. My, my Senate district was about 65 million. And that doesn't count money that we got to get from the transportation bill and, and, and some of the other bills. But, you know, in a, in a region where economic development is actively opposed by members of the metro, um, my philosophy is, okay, if you're going to oppose, oppose economic development, then we're going to try and take as much um, from, the, from the budget as we can to help our region to develop while we're still fighting um, for a lot of that economic development. So we will work on bonding. Fortunately, we last year we pretty much cleared the decks. Most of the projects that had requested and we were able to get to cover. There's a few things um, in our district we got to finish, I think, um, Floodwood, Hayden County, and of course now that 
hipping, the hipping water issue is, is going to be a big one that we're going to work on um, and try and get uh, taken care of. And I don't want to talk about all the good things, so I'm going to stop talking so that Spencer has some of the good things still to talk about. And then I guess take some questions. Well, thanks, Rob. We'll just spin off from there. So we'll talk about my kind of view, I think, what next session is going to be. Uh, I think the big thing that's going to drive where a session looks like right now, you have a surplus. Um, but that surplus, like Rob's already talking about, probably can be met by a lot of the bills um, that are over budget. But the kicker to all of that is in the tails, what we call it, so the next fiscal year in Minnesota, we're already forecasting a deficit. Um, and there's kind of no surprise there. You know, we used that almost $20 billion state surplus and was put into the budget. The budget grew by almost 40%. Um, so now we're going to kind of have to look at what we're going to do. So my hope for session is that we're not going to see anything major when it comes to policy or any legislative ideas. I think we've got a ton of bills that need easy fixes. I know when it comes to school lunches, I had the opportunity to kind of travel around the country this year and go to different conferences. It was actually a conversation I was talked to about a lot around the country. Different states are doing it. But when I said to them how Minnesota is doing it, I had people on both sides of the aisle look at me with their jaws dropping like, why is Minnesota doing it that way? Why aren't you doing the waiver system? Why aren't you prioritizing where it needs to be? Um, and I'm trying to try and bring all this back for the conversation because I think there is a right way to do the school lunches. Right? How come a school district like Rob and I represent over at Deer River, where it's almost 53% for Ingrid's lunch, is competing for the same funds where, as a waste out of school district that has 1% for Ingrid's lunch, if even. Those are simple fixes we can do to get that program back under budget and actually getting the money where it belongs. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing on things like that. Uh, you know, ESSD, which is that earn sick and safe time, pay them medical leave, those are both things that we have good solutions, bipartisan solutions that we need to be working on and bringing to the table. Um, because right now, and we said this on the House floor, what we're seeing of that tax break, uh, rate increasing the 1.5% already in the budget, it's exactly what happened on the East Coast when we instituted this stuff. So we were trying to warn the state of Minnesota saying these aren't bad policies, but we need to do them the right way. Uh, we also, I would love to address the fact that what it means for employers. You know, I think one of the biggest strengths we have living up here on the range is that, you know, one of your employees, one of your family comes into work and says, hey, I got problems at home and need to be home with a sick kid for three days. You as an employer can look at that person and go, yeah, absolutely, don't worry about it, you're a valued member of our team, that's fine. You'll still get paid. If you do that now under the new bill and the new language, that could result in a fine if you don't finally get paid work or do it the right way. I got a problem with that. I think most of us have a problem with that. So we can make adjustments and changes that way that I think can kind of get us in the middle and say both sides obviously agree we want some sort of you know, paid family leave for people to take care of their families and their loved ones. Let's just do it the right way. Um, so, in other words, and when it comes to session as a whole, those are the things I'm hoping. I haven't heard much. I serve as a member uh, of leadership on my caucus down there. So I'm hoping to hear from the majority party in the next few weeks to kind of listen to what that's going to be. But um, locally, I want to share a message that things have been working incredibly well. You know, I recognize so many of the faces in this room, and that's because over the last year, uh, we've all been working together to kind of pull this rope and bring the range forward. You know, whether it be working with the IEEE, whether it be working with our local nonprofits, working with our cities, a lot of really good things are happening. You know, the Highway 169 project, the reason we don't get money to get that started is because everyone from the Western Masada Line Land Board was helping to say you hitting writing letters and coming out and showing them and talking about it. That resulted in that project getting its first, you know, starting money in, gosh, over a decade. You know, so I want to impress and and I want to ask too, but how many people in this room get my newsletter? So please sign up for them. Because, and I don't do a lot in the interim, but when I'm in session, I'll do a letter every once a week to kind of let you know where things are at. But my last newsletter, for those that read it, I didn't talk about issues. I talked about the thing I saw the last year working in this district. And there's one thing that we have that's more powerful than any legislative issue. It's the fact that our communities are willing to work together and have a really renewed sense of hope that we can make good things happen up here on the range. Uh, we need to share that as much as possible right now. I was just saying at uh, another chamber event a few weeks back, everyone in this room, we know the issues, right? We need to build out small business. We need to have uh, build out housing, have affordable housing. We need lower tax. We need to have affordable energy. Everyone in this room knows that. I could sit here, we could sit here and talk about it all day. But the people that need to know that we're working on these things and going to accomplish these things are our next door neighbors. That person we run into at the grocery store. Because if we can't impress the hope that we have in this room for the good things that we're doing, 
what what's what good is it then? Because those people are going to share with their their kids that they can return back to here, or Calumet, or Grand Rapids, or Cohasset, or Cole. We need that hope so that this whole community, everyone around us, can rally behind the issues that we're carrying and talking about this room so we can accomplish it. So that's kind of one of my New Year's resolutions, is to share that message of hope, if you will, that all of us need to do a better job of that. Because Rob and I can't do it alone. We need everyone in this room working together. So that's kind of my update on everything, but really looking forward to hearing your questions. Giving um, <clears throat> this historically, is that some difficulty um, acquiring businesses to come here? And it's, it's one of its, it's our climate, of course, not one is, is logistics. And I think we're also stereo on either end with Virginia and Grand Rapids and have main highway corridors. So, um, and, and I'm all for the growth of our state, I'm all for the growth of the range, in my opinion, for a lot of years. But keeping in particular, because, you know, people will say, well, we're right in the middle of everything. And, it, and you know, if you look at a map, yeah. But we're technically we're on the way to other places. So, do either or both of you have any kind of ideas for how, how giving can, the chamber does a good job, they work hard at it, but it's, we, we have difficulty in tracking things here. We do have some assets that I don't think they can capitalize on, like the bike trail, our high speed internet, people that can work from home. Is there anything or uh, projects or visions you have for growing a, a, a place like it? Um, I, yeah. Um. So historically, we can look at attempts that have been made to try and create jobs. Um, the best and worst example is the chopsticks manager. We're like, we're going to build this, and we're going to have all of these jobs, and that didn't pan out. And then um, Gino Pucci wanted to put a food production plant in there that didn't work. Um, you know, over the years, there's been all of these things. I, I think what we're going to see is a, a shift maybe not quite as dramatic as the one in, so in the early 1900s, you have this shift of millions of people moving from farms to big cities. I think we're going to see a shift, probably not quite that dramatic, of people who are sick of living in the cities, they're sick of traffic, they're sick of crime, they're sick of high home prices, wanting to move back to the country. So how do we get people to, to move here? A few of the things, Greg, that you mentioned, um, we have the bike trail, we've got skiing, we've got a lot of outdoor stuff. We also need the homes. Um, and, you know, there's at least three realtors here that probably are getting calls weekly from people in the city say, hey, what do you have? We want to move up north. I'm still hearing from people that want to move back home. But we need the homes, and I know Betsy's working on, on some of that stuff, and, and Spencer and I, I think I can speak for Spencer, we're 100% supportive. I'm convinced if we were to build 200 to 300 um, middle-class type homes in Hibbing, they would sound like that. Um, so imagine if we could get 100 people who work from home, from Minneapolis, St. Paul, whatever, to move up here, we have high-speed internet, we have homes for them to move, and that's like a factory. And they're going to be spending money at places like Mike's, and they're going to be buying cars at the local dealership. Um, and, and I think that's, in my opinion, that's the direction we need to go for any other development. Um, you know, we have some we have some successes like LM Radiator in town that has expanded. Um, Detroit, in that diesel, and that's out by the airport. We've got some of those successes, but they're having a hard time getting the workers that they need. Um, I think we need to look broader. How do we bring people who work from home up here? Or even, you know, people that maybe would want to work at Allen and Radiator. If we were to build the houses that they could afford, they could work at Allen and Radiator and spend $200,000 less on a home here than they would in a, in a suburb of the Twin Cities. I think that's the direction that we'll probably be looking at going for growth in this area. And, and the other thing is, I mean, when I'm down in St. Paul, probably a third of the people that I talk to either are from the range, or their parents are from the range, or their grandparents, and at some point, probably in the 80s, they moved away. And a lot of them want to come back. And we just need to make that, we need to make that possible. So that's kind of a long answer. I don't know if it completely addresses what you're looking at. Oh, good answer. Um, but, and we have the land, and we have land everywhere. I look at the land explorer all the time. Well, Hibbing owns that. No one else is there. Hibbing owns that. Just give the land to a developer and say, put 100 houses up. And that's a lot of property taxes for the city. Yeah, I just want to jump off what Rob was saying. I mean, him and I share this, this conversation a lot because we, we believe the same thing. 
it's it's about attract, attracting the next generation, and they're also changing a lot, right? I mean, I was just having a conversation with uh, this couple, is it uh, 21 and 22, and they were talking about how they're entrepreneurs. Like, oh, what's the business you're going to What's the brick and mortar thing? They're not brick and mortar. They're working on their house, or they're helping them flip a house, or they're you know starting some sort of Amazon store. And you know, me, I'm like, well, what does that mean? I mean, they're making tens of thousands of dollars on these totally virtual businesses that they're creating. But those are the kind of people that we need to identify and say, come back home to the area. Come back home to the right? Because Rob's going to right. Either they're going to buy one of our houses and fix it up, or they're going to buy a new house. They're going to put kids in our fantastic schools. That I think that's the key to really booming this place out, uh, is, is getting a next generation to return. Uh, because then when you, as soon as you start having kids and those kids start going to school, then you're going to start getting planted. If we get those planted on people, well, then it's just going to keep snowballing. So, yeah, Rob and I are the same day. And I, I want to add one thing. I think that an advantage that Hibbing is going to have, and unfortunately, Hibbing hasn't had the advantage over a lot of people, they're just like, you know, Grand Rapids and Virginia, who have the highways that go through here. But um, this is probably going to sound a little controversial, but our power plant is going to, I think, become an advantage as the, the 2040 energy bill takes effect and energy prices skyrocket and, and people around the state have brownouts and blackouts, there's going to be pivoting. It's producing our own power with wood chips that we get from McGregor Pallet. And they are they have the potential to grow so that even you know Pastor Dan over in Chisholm could, could get his power from the Hibbing public utilities. So that when the rest of the state has their power blinking off and on, Hibbing is going to be a shining beacon of hey, this is how we can do it, this is how we can do it right. One of the things that Spencer and I have to get across the finish line, hopefully this session is to get um, wood, wood waste considered carbon neutral so that Hibbing doesn't have to pay the uh, carbon credit or whatever, whatever it's going to be uh, But I think, yeah, yeah. Um, he's on the energy committee, yeah, I'm not, so. Um, but I'm just impressed with what they're doing over at the, uh, at the public utilities, switching back to, um, to, the wood, to the wood waste. And it's, I mean, what, what could be a better source of energy? You have the wood waste from the pallet so either they're going to burn it to get rid of it and get nothing out of it, or they're just going to dump it in a field and it's going to even affect it. Or they can ship it up to Hibbing, we can use it to create electricity and steam as the byproduct, so we're doing a two for one. And then the farmers are taking the ash and use it, using their fields. I mean, there isn't a much better way to produce energy uh, with minimal impact on the environment. I think that's an advantage that it's going to have. And we were this close. We got it into the final Senate bill last year. And it ended up getting stripped in conference, but, but I think there's some support with the FCA to get that across the finish line next year. Um, <clears throat> one of the things regarding housing was uh, the latest developments about well, Lumber's River Creek a number of years ago in the Sawa Pines. Um, so what's all that money from the I mean, because the cost to do a development for new home construction. It, it, it's not profitable unless you get some, some monies for infrastructure or land donated. Um, most people, we just did a spec house up by the golf course, and it's a nice spec house. It's 2,200 square feet, a three stall garage, brand new. It's selling for 380000 Most people can't afford that. We don't have enough in that price range when you can relocate to Elmo in that 200 range where that's probably our, our sweet spot for people wanting to be. So we don't have enough existing houses to sell. And it's difficult for a developer to want to invest some money when you have you know, construction costs right now are 250 a square foot for an average entry level nice home. Um, so does the state have anything, or is there any plan that we can say, you know, we've got land, or we are help with infrastructure. You know, the IRRB will step in on certain projects. Does the state have anything like that for rural areas like us? Yeah, so there's some conversations had last year, uh, last session, about creating housing kind of funds. There is, how big is the pot bill that we so, so the total bill was a billion dollars. So most of that same dimension. Yeah, and it's, a lot of it is to, it's a, it's a weird bill. Yeah. A lot of it was to um, allow access for people to get loans, so like people who maybe wouldn't qualify for a loan now, there's more, you know, first-time home buyers during the sort of seconds. The problem with that is it's going to increase demand, but it doesn't really increase supply. I think only about a third of that bill 
was for new housing, and then with all the strings attached, and actually Betsy probably knows a lot of the strings attached, you have to have mixed, mixed use. Um, it can't necessarily be all for single family homes, which is specifically what I'm thinking about. Um, but there is some money. I think most of it is going to go to the metro, probably the suburbs, to throw up apartment buildings or condos. Some of it will go in Greater Minnesota, but we also have, and Spencer's the chair of the IRRR, so I want us to all of this under, but we've got $5 million in the IRRR budget this year, for, specifically for housing. And I think that's probably going to go pretty quickly. Uh, so, there, so there's money out there. One of the things that I'm encouraging all of the communities, and some of them are sort of landlocked, they're out of land, they don't really have land, but communities like Hibbing or um, Virginia Nashua, who actually have land, give it away. Give it to the developer, say, if you come, you can have this 40 acre, but you have to build 50 houses there. You can have the land for free, we'll try and get money from the IRRR to put the utilities in, we'll do what we can to make it cheap, you know, cheap enough that you can actually make a profit. But I think we need a partnership between the cities, the IRRR, if there is a way to access those state funds. Um, but, you know, that I think the old, the old way of thinking of, uh, well, you know, we can't give you the land, you're going to pay us for it. Well, then they're not going to come. You know, it's, it's kind of like that um, in the 1860s where they said, hey, there's 160 acres. You have to come, you have to farm it for a certain amount of time, and that's what developed the West. I think we're going to have to look at the creative things like that again, where here's the land, you have it for free, but you have to put 40 houses on it or, or whatever. Land. So, sorry, I am. Like, no, you're good. Time. No, I mean, and, and Rob kind of you know, teaming up perfectly right there. With the IRRR, it's got great in this share to work with the commissioner, you were working on that. New pilot for housing, so I'm really excited about that. I think we're going to see a lot of good things come out of it. Exactly what I was talking about, to create partnerships. You know, one of the things that I think could really drive housing uh, is doing it said, finding those lots, getting them planted out, getting them ready for a developer, but also realizing that we also need people to come here and build them too. We have a lot of home builders, and I talk to them a lot, but I know one of the builders that uh, I was going to see if he came up to my house this summer and do a quick little weekend job for me. He's already booked out for all next summer building houses. And I think we know that, that most of our builders are already booked out a year, two years in advance. Those aren't going to be the people that are going to be able to build out that very home neighborhood for us. So we as communities are going to have to partner with you know, city and local governments uh, and neighborhoods and find a way to say, okay, maybe this larger developer, a little bit closer to the city, so we can couple some dollars together to come up, stay in one of our hotels, pay food at all of our restaurants, and oh, by the way, and they can probably have to build up in two or three months a 30 home neighborhood, sell a house at you know, 250 grand, which would sell like hotcakes. But I think it's just going to take all of us again to like to be pulling together and having those tough conversations. So, trust me, I'm from here. I'm not all big on you know, signing a bill to have a bunch of people from our, not our area come and build homes. But we also need them. And I think that's a tough conversation we all need to look at ourselves and have. I think another thing that businesses, and I've, I've talked to mining companies about this, talked to hospitals about this. In the 1960s, when, when uh, the Tappanek plants were all coming online, for instance, you can look at Erie Mine over by Bath. What did they do? They built whole towns. Point Lakes didn't exist. Erie Mine built Point Lakes. They built whole neighborhoods of Aurora. And so I've also been encouraging business owners, hey, if you are having a hard time getting workers, build houses and say, hey, if you come to work for us for five years, you can have this house at this price instead of this price. So I think that's another you know, way of looking at the past and how things were done in the past, and maybe we could probably replicate that. But that would be up to the individual businesses. Uh, so Betsy Labonte, Community Development here in the city of Hibbing. The city council will be taking up in workshop tonight a local housing trust fund um, ordinance to talk about allowing for some of that to happen. So it, a local housing trust fund within a city is a way that private entities can donate in to build housing in the community of their choice. And we're hoping to partner with AEOA and folks that understand how to do that well um, for workforce and affordable and those sorts of things and do some owner-occupied rehab with the current housing stock that we have, but also allow for other you know, developments to happen. And we are you know, developing some land um, up on the hill right now, and it's right now in, in the stage of waiting for the um, MPCA to come back and say, yes, you're right, iron does exist in your soils, um, and you're okay to build there. Um, and once we have that, um, then 
you know, it will be ready for builders and those sorts of things and for that community visioning process. So, How many spots are going to be up there? Um, at this point, we don't know because the community visioning process has to happen. So, yeah, it's about 70 acres right now. So our housing needs analysis did get presented and is on our website. It does show the need over the next 12 years in the city of Hibbing for 1,200 units. So that's 100 units a year. So yes, um, Senator Barnett is correct in what he's saying. Um, and obviously, we've talked quite a bit. So, um, and Representative Igo is, you know, that's why they've created some of this funding. So we're working very closely with with our legislators to make that happen. And you know, if you have ideas, come talk to me about them because we're ready. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pat Ives. I'm the director of a child care center in town, and I know that both of you are supporting early childhood, um, along with housing. That is the feedback issue we're getting. We need child care to work, um, and I, you have both supported that in the past. One of the things that I would just like to share with you about the industry is the impact that the safe and sick time has had. Any racial-based business, so a racial-based business means I have to have one caregiver, one teacher qualified, one, one, one for this many children. So when these people take their safe and sick time off, I have to pay someone else to replace them. And it's not only child care, it's nursing homes, it's hospitals. So those industries are going to feel that impact because of the need for ratio. No, I, I hear you a lot of clear. Richard Revolt talked about that either in the video or the floor of the ratio and that exact problem. Uh, again, that's maybe one of the fixes we need to have, but I think let's hone it down to the talk about child care specifically. Um, that's one of the things when I got down to St. Paul in 21, I started wanting to talk about my Did you pull your hair out? Because I do. <laughs> no, it just turns gray. It just turns gray. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing that's driving me nuts about child care is the child care of when I was a kid is gone. The neighborhood, you know. Grandma, grandpa, stay at home, mom, or dad can't watch kids legally anymore. And that was our bread and butter. Up here. Um, we need to find ways to help incentivize that to allow it to happen again and allow places like you run to be able to, have, be able to fluctuate and work with what your community needs. Because, because grandma and grandpa are out playing pickleball. <laughs> so they don't want to stay home with the littles anymore. <laughs> 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 And I think that's one of the things that we see that the state's doing a lot right now is we see an issue pop up maybe in the metro area that it becomes state policy. We saw a lot of this happen in education. You know, the reason child care changed so much is because of some really bad stuff that happened in Minneapolis and Seattle. No one in this room is not going to say we need to protect kids. We need to. But the issues that they were dealing with down there are not the issues we deal with up here. And we need to be able to have that kind of fluidity to be able to <clears throat> set things up that work for us because we're way different. Same argument for education, but right? you know, all the stuff that's not passed in the education bill this year made it look like the state of Minnesota is the new school district. Well, I've been talking to school board members and superintendents from Deer River to Ely, and they just want the school boards to run the way that they can see it. So I think we need to do the same thing with child care, is make it regional, make it be able to work so you know we can help figure out the ratios that work for you, or figure out, okay, if this person got one, we'll find exceptions for you at an SST, because you probably uh, deal with your employees a lot differently than someone a gigantic child care facility in Napa Valley. And we need to respect that and honor that as you being a small business owner. So those are just kind of thoughts, but I hear you a lot. And when it was an absolute necessity to have our emergency workers during the COVID, um, we were given all kinds of exemptions. But as soon as that ended, then it was back to the old rules with the Department of Human Services. And hopefully you're supportive of the new department because we all feel that that will help with the break off of the new department of children and families. I think the only thing I want to add is that you, you perfectly articulated what I try to say is that government, all of these government regulations are making it more difficult for every business to operate. Um, the problem with childcare, in my opinion, and I've heard you know, from childcare providers all over, they spend more time doing paperwork than taking care of kids. Um, and it, you know, again, when I when I was a kid, um, the first few years of my life, my mom stayed home. Then when she went back to work, I went to Mrs. Sunquist, who lived two blocks away, and she took care of us. And I don't know what my mom paid her um, to, uh, to to 
take care of it. But that isn't an option anymore, because if she didn't pay, somebody who's you know, not a family member, I don't know all the rules, you can't do that. So I think we need to return to that flexibility. The problem is when you dare to suggest that, when somebody says, oh yeah, but what about you know, this instance of this child who died, because there wasn't all of this oversight. And so it's tough. It's tough for us to say, hey, we need more flexibility, because then they'll say, oh, you want kids to die. Um, but the reality is, you know, these, these people, like when Spencer is talking about the grandmas or the aunts or whatever, they've raised kids. They know how to keep children alive and how to feed them. And there should be flexibility. You know, centers like yours should have flexibility, but that's not enough to meet all of the need. So I think we need a flexible approach, and, um, and the government just needs to for the most part, keep their fingers out of it and allow communities to take care of each other. So, um, and, and yeah, I mean that with all of the mandates, so Spencer mentioned schools, I've talked to superintendents and school board members who are like, we would have rather not got any new money because the, the majority is bragging, oh, historic money for schools. They're like, we would have rather not had any new money as long as there were no mandates because there were some. I mean, giving is looking at cutting a million bucks, Grand Rapids is what, three million, two million? Um, I think most of the school districts in my Senate district are looking at cutting for next year, and a lot of that has to do with all of the mandates. I just talked talk to the curriculum director giving yesterday about the READ Act that was just passed, and I support the READ Act. For those who don't know, about 15 or 20 years ago, some idiot at an ivory tower at a college, sorry, Aaron. <laughs> idea that we need to start changing the way we teach reading to this whole word reading. So rather than teaching kids phonics, they're like, hey, you have to memorize sight words and then learn context cues, and that's how you're going to learn how to read. So we have a generation of kids who didn't learn how to read using phonics. People now are realizing, hey, that was a bad idea, so now we're returning to phonics. Of course, they have to rebrand everything, so they're calling it the science of learning, which is a good thing, okay? That's how we've learned how to read forever until the last 20 years. But they, they put it in the bill and they say, yeah, you have to do it by 2025 and you have to provide 61 hours of training for this staff by 2025 and then another 61 hours for this next tier of staff. And the curriculum director's like, where am I going to find 61 hours? Are they going to shut school down for a week so I can train teachers? And I'm like, no, parents will flip. If you shut school down, schools down for a week, she said, well, then we need $170,000 in order to pay teachers to come in after school or on whatever to get this training. And so, it, again, it's another unintended consequence where they're like, yeah, we're going to pass this bill. You have to do it by this amount of time. And it's going to cost just the Hibbing School District probably $170,000. Um, and there's a lot of other mandates. like, And that was actually one of the good ones. If that was a standalone bill, I probably would have voted for it and then said, okay, we've got to fix you know, iron up the cakes. Um, a lot of the other stuff are, are just garbage. So. It has been really cool to watch. I was just in an elementary school, and we're always starting to institute that. And it was really cool seeing a group of third graders learn what a word means. They were trying to break down biology, and they're learning like the Greek and Latin roots in third grade. It's like, wow, all right, that's that's really cool. You can just tell these kids' minds were working sometimes. It's that was a cool thing to see. Uh, actually, get back into the classroom. Hi, Jason Ash, Minnesota Power. Uh, regionally, there's an effort to figure out how we play in the next generation of, of steel and iron and, and decarbonized steel in the world. Does that have any part of this next upcoming session in the state support for that effort? Or can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so I'll take that one first because that's being on the Energy Committee, that's been something I've been trying to couple with. Uh, when I, one of the bills I've been carrying since the beginning is carbon capture, carbon sequestration technology, which would be huge for. Know, iron and steel industries, if we can, you know, it, one of the best ways to make us competitive right now in the world when it comes to the products that leave the range would be to have carbon neutral or carbon negative steel. Because no matter how cheap China's going to make it, they can't make it carbon negative or carbon neutral. It'll make us the most competitive steel product in the world. If we do that, we're never going to have to worry about the clients up here. Um, so, one of the big things, and I was just on a meeting last week talking about trying to go for some, trying to get some dollars moving to do some pilot type projects on it. Um, it's going to require a lot of work. We're going to need you know, reliable power, uh, affordable. That's one of the biggest problems. If you're an MPM, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the other things I carry when we work with that is having that diverse energy approach. Right now, the 2040 bill only allowed for solar and wind. Well, we're not going to be mining tachinite and making steel and solar. We need more heavy base load power than that. 
So I'm trying to remove the nuclear energy moratorium. So MP, if they want, we'll go look out and say, well, what a small-scale reactor be? We, to put here Hibbing or Cohasset or Virginia to power our mines. Uh, also looking at ways that we can, you know, for, for biomass. But the thing is, if we can get that broad support, have that affordable, reliable power, then we could look at doing electrolysis to get the hydrogen to make the green steel to do it. But I think we're going to need to unlock more tools in the toolbox to make sure we can get that done for it to happen. But I know it's a conversation I'm having, and I went to many of these energy conferences um, and shared that kind of vision. And people are like, wait a minute, you could, you could make green steel? Yeah, we could, but you need to give me the tools, our communities, the tools to do it. Um, because my biggest fear right now is that if we don't get these things expanded and don't make sure we can keep the cost of energy low, what's going to force our minds out here on their own before we can give them a chance to make the green steel? Um, I just, when I'm, as long as I'm on my energy box, I, I, I want to say my, my big thing with energy right now, if we spent the last 100 years in this country from about the 20s to now, doing everything we can to lower the cost of power. Because when you lower the cost of power, you put more money in people's pocket. When you put more money in people's pocket, you give more prosperity, communities you know, grow, everyone does better. That's why, you know, since the 80s, what's the number one thing we've been doing in Africa? Giving them water, and building out the electrical grid. You know, how many people have like been to a foreign country or seen pictures of what their electrical grids have like over there? It's like a spider web of wires and the bird wings out, the whole grid's out for a week. We've been doing everything we can to get that power lower to build prosperity. 2040 build the exact opposite now. Now we're going to increase power to decrease a carbon footprint, but at what cost? At what cost? So when your so when your electric bill jumps 50, 60 percent in a year, and you have less money in your pocket, more than you already do because there's 11 and a half percent inflation. We need to figure out ways to keep that cost low while doing the carbon neutral, and that's expanding the energy approach rather than just two things, which oh by the way aren't made with you know American resources and manufacturing. They're coming across the seas with a carbon footprint that takes years to remove anything. So we need to start thinking locally, and that's one of the big things that I think we can work on as a region, and that we're getting traction on is saying, yeah, we're okay having solar wind. How do we mine it, manufacture it, sell it, and recycle it right here in Minnesota? And oh, by the way, we could probably do it all in the iron range because we've got the rail, the infrastructure, and the power to do so. That is our avenue to get those things done. But it's got to be in all of the above, otherwise it's just not. These are roads to Northeast Technical Services. Can you speak a little bit about the culture and climate surrounding non terrorist projects on the Capitol? Yeah, the culture and climate about non terrorist well, it's 99% dishonest. Um, a, a former senator once said that the, there's an environmental lobbyist in there. I'm not going to apologize, but um, <laughs> the most dishonest people that he's had to work with is environmental lobbyists. And I'll give you an example. So an environmental lobbyist brought a bill to one of our members in the Senate. He's a suburban member and they love the Boundary Waters because the one week every year that they go out there. And they brought up the bill and said, hey, sign this bill, this protects the Boundary Waters. That's it. It's already in law, so please sign the bill and drop the bill. And this is a lobbyist that he had worked with. He signed the bill, dropped the bill. Uh, when Spencer and I and Ike Warren and some others saw the bill, we flipped out. Because the bill didn't just That's protect right. it. Yeah. The bill <laughs> didn't just protect the boundary waters. It it um, it would have banned all mining in the Rainy River watershed, which goes I mean way farther west than International Falls, almost the whole arrowhead. I mean it's this is an area larger than a lot of these coast states. And so we went and explained to him this doesn't just protect the boundary waters or the boundary waters buffer. We showed him the map and said, holy crap, what have I done? <laughs> Um, so he pulled the bill back, um, but that's just an example. They just lied to him. They said, no, this doesn't change anything, and it dramatically changed things. They're extremely dishonest. Um, they have people in the Twin Cities believing that we're going to be mining in the boundary waters. They have no idea that it's outside of the boundary waters, even outside of the, the buffer zone. Um, and so the climate is very difficult. And, you know, the, I mentioned earlier that, you know, third or a fourth of the people down in the Twin Cities at one time lived in the Iron Range. So probably everybody has family members and friends that live down in the Twin Cities. We need to start spreading the message that, hey, you are being lied to. And I can't put it, I mean, I can't sugarcoat it. These people are being lied to. Um, and the reality is we can, we can get 
those minerals here, the union workers, and we do it cleanly, or we can use slave and child labor in Africa and Indonesia and China. And they have documented children as young as four in the Congo working in these nickel mines. This is this is a, a, a BBC article or something like that. I mean, this is this is legitimate. This isn't this isn't Glencore or, or you know one of the big mining companies saying, look, there's child labor. This is independent um, news uh, news casters. So that's a long answer to a short question. The climate is the climate is challenging, but I do have a few um, of the senators that have been opposed to it that have agreed. Yeah, I'll, we'll go up and take a tour. We'll, we'll look at it. We just have to work that out to get them up there and take a tour because I think if they see it, they talk to the environmental engineers, um, then I think they will realize that they've been lying. I, I think one of the things to add to it is I try to have grace for some of my colleagues that you know, are very viciously activists against mining. I'll use my plug on that. You know, there's two types of people you can be when you're a legislator. You can be an activist, you can be an advocate. Activists are never going to compromise. That's their way of the highway. An advocate, you know, Rob and I are both advocates for non ferrous mining. I'm never going to say, you know, it's non ferrous mining of us, even if we destroy the world. You never, no one in this room is going to say that. That's what we're advocates. But the grace I try to have for some of my colleagues is you have to remember how small some of these districts are. So I have the seventh largest house district in the state, over three counties, right? But one of my colleagues who's really rampant against any sort of non ferrous mining in Minnesota has a district that's probably, I don't know, 14 city blocks. In Minneapolis. So when you put that in perspective, 14 blocks of people, well, it's pretty easy to you know create a little bubble or illusion of this is what these people want, this is what I'm gonna do. Well, when you live in this, you know, whether it's social media or this community, it's very easy to think, you know, everything's good. What I used with the chair of energy two years ago. I said, Congratulations, I hope you're patting yourself on the back and you did something for the world today, passing something for solar and wind when all you did is just push manufacturing and supply chains out of our, our state and out of our country. I had someone in the energy committee say, and he said, well, you know, Representative Igo, uh, solar panels that come from China, carbon neutral for about three or four years of production. I said, great. I hope that four-year-old gets their life back after that. And then he just was like taken back there and say something so rude. But they, they're not understanding the larger part of the conversation. And that's where it's on us to kind of say, listen, go from here to here to here. Uh, and that's how we're slowly, I think, going to change that climate and that culture, if you will. Um, I think the 2040 bill is helping to spur that. I've had some meetings with, over the last couple of weeks, even, of groups that are usually historically against continental mining that have now been talking and saying, hey, we see you're working on permitting regulation reform. I think we want to help with that. We are noticing that we're going to need this stuff. Awesome. That's the first step. So now it's let's build those relationships with that. Besides breaking you guys a chance to get, um, what can the business community do to help advance that message? We all see it here locally, right? That being that like a business, so uh, our business is to build properly, concept of business, to some extent, it has uh, is impacted by the successor of the house of mining in the What can we do to help advance that message? I, I think the easiest thing that everyone in this room can start doing more of, because I know everyone here does it enough, but we got to start talking about ourselves a lot more. Um, you know, you just think about communities an hour and a half south of here, how much knowledge they have of the that goes on an hour and a half north of here. It's very minuscule, right? Um, we need people to be able to start talking about what we're doing. Um, you know, a lot of my friends um, around the country, I've been talking with them a lot, like, wait a minute, you have third largest copper nickel deposit in the whole world in northern Minnesota. Yeah. They didn't know about that. I would say people in the Twin Cities don't even understand the magnitude. They're being peddled at, you know, my like, I gotta remember to say it like New Range. People are being told that New Range is only like a six year project that would only make enough copper for like you know, a thousand batteries. It's just not worth it. People don't understand the magnitude of what we have here. That's on us to share them. And I think it's also on us as business communities, as people really talk with um, those larger state groups. So like this group, we really got to connect with the statewide chamber. And the statewide chamber has been doing a lot of great stuff with the permanent regulation reform. We should be releasing a report here. Yeah, Shelly, have you got any updates on it? But it should be any day here now. We worked on a statewide report on the state permanent regulation reform. 
So we're finally trying to get the state chambers here, which is a huge organization that can lead for stuff. Now when that report comes out, uh, I want to ask you all of our chambers up here, you know, Rapids, Hidden, Laurentian, it's time for us to buy in on that report and get our seat at the table and get some things fixed. I think just as simple as that sounds, it, it's going to require multiple voices. Uh, Dominic for lots of market populations there on the transit. Um, I have uh, just a quick piggyback off that question then too. Um, before I do that, one quick fun fact, American Transit is the largest rural public transportation system in the state of Minnesota based on a higher range and the second largest in the country, square miles wise. So we're seven times larger than the metro. And we try to push that messaging out as much as possible and we've really been hitting that hard these last two months. Um, what is the additional messaging that the business community should use in our marketing and public relations efforts when I'm going down to KSTP in the Twin Cities and talking about AT and how great we are and how big we are with my exec director or with my director over at Airline Transit? What are the other little things that we can add into that conversation about how great the Iron Range is to continue to support these projects going through that? I, I think that our biggest draws are quality of life. Uh, and I use a really simple story when I talk about it. So when we go to the grocery store, it's apropos and raw. How's your day going? What's new? Are you run into a friend? Or if you're not that person, everyone kind of looks at you. Right? But when I'm in the Twin Cities getting some groceries for my apartment, and I stop at one of the grocery stores, I say, hey, how are you doing today? The clerk bringing me up. They will look at me like I'm crazy. Why I'm losing my mind, or why is this person even speaking words? That is our greatest attraction. It's the fact that the Iron Range is a place where community still exists. Right? When you go out, whether it be just to go get dinner with your family, whether you're just stopping at a business to maybe get something at an L and M or a Lowe's to go fix something in your house, you're throwing money into something. We can't plan 20 minutes to go to town. It's two hours. It's community who us really matters. And I think especially after COVID. People in the Twin Cities Metro who are trying to attract back up here lost a sense of community when they're isolated and are realizing even more that when we go up, we don't have it. We still have it. And it's one of the most powerful things we have. I think if we can share that message that community, our iron range where community still exists. We have it. And that, that is something I think we can share a lot more to get people to realize that so, is there an effective place to share this direct community with your office then too, so you can share these stories of Arrowhead Transit is on KSTP in the Twin Cities. We're down in St. Paul today, or well, we're going down in a month to go do a live show with um, their their team. So, where do we share that with you guys so you can share that? Look at these Iron Range businesses are here. Yeah, all you have to do is just be a well, you can either text me, my phone number is public with us, and you can email me, <laughs> whatever you want, I can get it on my Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, the same way. Yeah, you can, you can tag us. Um, so we can share things. One thing that I just want to add to that, though, because the question was about non fares and spreading the message. And so, yeah, spread the message about how great it is here. And when you live here, when it's freezing out, you choose to live here. Uh, keeps the river at all, I guess. Um, but I think specifically, like on KSTV, if they ask about mining or something like that, all you got to do is tell the truth. We will not be mining in the boundary waters. We will not be mining in the boundary waters buffers. That is the truth. Um, Spencer mentioned one of the other lies that they're spreading is, oh, it's only, you're only going to you know mine for this amount of time, and then it's going to be dirty forever. No, there's at the at the um, new range site. There's at least 100 years of ore there, so they're going to be mining for at least 100 years, paying into the environmental fund for at least 100 years. But people don't know that. They're like, oh, it's going to ravage the earth in 10 years, and then declare bankruptcy and leave. That's, that's not true. Another example um, that the opponents have tried to use recently, how many how many saw the article that the Verge Lake up by Ely is possibly going to be on one of the impaired waters lists? Anybody see that? And so like, see, that's cool. We can't mine because even iron mining um, caused that. Well, the interesting thing is all of the tests that they've done over the years have shown that that lake is fine. All of a sudden, this outside anti-mining interest group is doing the test and like, oh, these numbers are off the charts. Is it possible that they have some sort of incentive to find those numbers that are a lot higher? But people don't know that. They're just like, oh, those numbers are terrible. But what about all of the tests? Every single test that had been done before that showed that Birch Lake is just fine. I mean, there are some spots that have a little bit higher um, sulfate than others. But the truth, we have the truth on our side. 
we just we have to get it out. Um, you know, another, another thing that just drives me nuts is the sulfate standards. Um, the sulfate standard in Minnesota is 10 parts per million. You have more sulfate in your drinking water on your table than these mines are supposed to be discharging. Um, Canada has some of their lakes that actually have wild rice has up to a thousand parts per million. But these people believe all the wild rice in Minnesota are going to die if we don't have this 10 parts per million. So again, all of these little things that are that are true that people don't know I like, will help um, will help our cousin. It just it just drives me nuts because I know that people have been lied to. So a, a funny story on that I was on a panel on my <coughs> at an energy event in Michigan, so there was like three, four hundred people there and I'm going back and forth with a uh, a climate activist and environment activist who was telling me these mines out here are gonna destroy the environment. And you know, we gotta keep the sulfates out of the water. And I I couldn't help it. He was drinking a bottle of water, a plastic bottle of water while I'm doing it. And I looked at him and said, you know, isn't it crazy to think that that bottle of water has got more sulfates in it than any of our mines and ends up here on the iron range? But that's crazy. You can't. It's the truth. And the whole crowd kind of got, like, you could tell it shifted. It was like, wow, that is kind of crazy that I can drink more sulfates in a mine. Um, great talking about you, by the way, during the argument. <laughs> that's another bottle of water. <laughs> I just want to make one comment, uh, as Dean had it mirrored to me now, is the last legislative session, how well both Senator Harnsworth and Representative Eichel communicated back and forth with city staff and our range delegations up here as far as other cities. Through the whole process, we knew the direction they were going, why they were doing what they're doing, which really made it very easy for us to, to back a lot of the decisions they made. The communication was just phenomenal, and, and I'm looking forward to this legislative session uh, so that we're always in the know of where we're going and how the legislative session is leading. So I want to thank you for that and, and let everybody here know how important that was for our staff at the city to uh, know the direction that we were going. And, and it was a uh, banner year for our Arrowhead region, the Iron Range, giving in monies that we did receive. So I, I just want to thank you for the hard work you did. And, and I know you took some criticisms during part of this, but yet we benefited for the reasons that, that they stuck to their guns. And, and also, there was a lot of bipartisan uh, communication between the other legislators up here, from Hostchild in, in, in uh, Hermantown to Lizelgard out east, because you can't just do it. It takes both parties right now to fight for our region. And uh, we have a wonderful way of life up here, and, and we have two great leaders uh, that are really fighting for what we need and where we should go with our communities at this time. And I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. And, and it goes both ways. It goes both ways. City having all your staff and everyone up here was showing up every single. I mean, it was almost what every other week. Yeah, I was running into someone from City having who was down here helping us on. Again, message of it all. It takes all of us working together. So thank you to you as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for doing that. So I guess my party, my party thing was me. Oh, I have another question. Oh, no, 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 I'm going to let you know <laughs> I, The cannabis plant factory in Grand Rapids, right? And you thought it was a good idea. You voted for the IRRR, you provided funding, you voted against it. And have you, how has your perspective evolved in the last couple months? Or do you still think the other guy is just off? <laughs> 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 With friends like me, who can send things Um. So, of course, the marijuana bill passed, it's legal. And, I, and I've said this to people before, when it comes to marijuana, I'm kind of a libertarian. If somebody wants to you know, smoke a joint in their basement, as long as they're not driving, that's none of my business. I, I prefer not to do it, I choose not to do it. You know, I prefer that people didn't because of it. But, you know, if, if they choose to do it, my problem with, with that particular, um, with that no vote in the IRRR is that it's not something that I think we should spend public money to support. I mean, we've spent years 
um, saying, you know, telling kids don't do this, don't smoke marijuana. There's still, I think, in Deer River High School on their stairs, you know, uh, Deer River students don't smoke marijuana. So we're, on one hand, we're saying don't do this. On the other hand, we're using public money. Um, and so for me, it was a pretty easy no vote. On the other hand, um, I wasn't upset with Spencer's vote because he looks at it and said, hey, this could be 250 to 400 jobs if this actually pans out. And so, you know, I look at that and say, it's not something that I'm willing to use public money for. But on the other hand, I wasn't upset that Spencer was because, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, both votes, I think, have their merits. So. Yeah, and I'll just add, <clears throat> first off, it's nothing new for the delegation to be voting differently. It's, it's something that's been happening for decades before us. Um, my floss down at the Rockwell Circuit, I mean, it's a minimum of 250 jobs up to 400 with like a starting salary of sixty seven thousand dollars a year. Those are good jobs up here. Um, and I looked at it and said, okay, it's legal now. There's no walking that back. And if we don't take a step right now, all these facilities are going to be located in the metro. And we're just going to lose a seat at the table to be able to take any of the future policy on it or to make any of the dollars on it. And I also looked at it through the lens by Tasca County. You know, we're lucky here in St. Louis County that you guys have the minds you do and the port of Duluth. Tax account is losing tax base left and right. Uh, you know, the Boston Energy Center has closure dates. That's like 20% of all of Tax Economy's tax base. Uh, if they lose land and paper company at any time, then that's more tax base. Uh, they're lucky they get the taxes they do off the key tank. So I looked at it and said, this is a huge opportunity for them. It's jobs. Uh, uh, and that's why I think I voted for it. I think we can see a learning environment from it. Uh, obviously, I think opportunity to welcome um, that kind of partnership and learn from it. Uh, so again, there's just two sides to the story, but I see Rob and I are still friends. It's still really alive. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can vote no, I can vote yes. It happens all the time, but we'll see what the project brings. Okay. Final comments from um, So, uh, if I can remember what I was going to say. Um, so, so Spencer mentioned like the, the hipping folks were down at the Capitol a lot, and I think that's something that's important too. Is if you want to advocate, I know it's it's tough. You got to take time off from work, but come down to the Capitol and don't just come to see me and Spencer. Try and make appointments with other legislators so that you can spread the message. Um, you know, one of the things that the PUC is doing there, you know, they're meeting with um, the, the energy, the, the uh, chair of the energy committee in the Senate, meeting with the chair of the bonding committee. Um, trying to spread the word, and it, it, it's actually beneficial that the chair of the bonding committee was born in Hibbing, so she sort of has that nostalgic, even though she only lived here a few months. Um, but that sort of thing helps because now she's got Hibbing on on her radar. So, um, so I would say one of one of the frustrations, and, and it's not this group specifically because this group actually went above and beyond, but a lot of groups down at the Capitol, like hey, at the Capitol, are like, "Friends, you got to stop this. You got to stop this." But then when it came time to testify, we're like, hey, we need testifiers that are against us. So like, no, 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 you, you need to fight this for us. We can only do so much, but we need people to actually show up and testify and say, this is, this is a bad bill or this is a good bill. We need this or we don't need that. Um, because the more people that do that, the more, you know, the other side, you know, those, and I'm not saying Republican or Democrat, or just people that don't understand what our way of life is. The more people go and help us spread the message the better that would be. So. Well, I just want to <clears throat> thank the Chamber for this opportunity this morning and thank you all you for coming out on a cold morning to you know, spend some time with us. Uh, it's great to hear your questions and comments on things because Rob and I right now are both in that play. You know, we're back to it less than four weeks now and you know, we look back at you know meetings like this and the stories we heard when we're in committee on the House floor and need to tell the story. So just thank you for that. Um, it will be a, an interesting year ahead. Again, I'm still waiting for what the roadmap looks like. But uh, please, I'm going to make a plug again. Please sign up for my newsletter because I want to keep all of you in the loop uh, so I can share those stories with you. So if you have an idea, you can get it to me. Or it's, hey, I'm going to be, you know, for some sort of work event or conference, I'm going to be in the Capitol. Is it worth me swinging by and seeing you and a few other members? I can help connect that with you. If, you, know, you want to do a day at the Capitol with some of your companies, let Rob and I help you with that because we need to be present more than ever. Because it's really easy for the metro right now. If there's a maybe a metro-centric bill and it gets scheduled three days in advance, well, it's a 20-minute drive, and, and you know they could probably make the meeting at five o'clock so people can get off work a half hour early and make it. We don't have that luxury, so when we do find ways to get our people down there and make an impact, let's do it. 
So just thank you again for everyone's time and stay warm up. That's a great idea as far as if people are coming to St. Paul for any reason, if they want to come to the cabin, let you know ahead of time so you can make sure you're available and also you can give them ideas other key representatives or senators who should, they should also make an appointment with and uh, to try to maximize the input and effectiveness. And I do want to say, come see me. I didn't want you to think that I was saying, don't come see me, go see me. Come see me, but also go see other things. I like visitors. I want to see. I get homesick. So. <laughs> when it's all been said and done, there'll be nothing left to say or do. So let's uh, give them one more round of applause. Today, thank you for Shelly and the Living Chamber of Commerce staff for organizing this. And uh, thank you to Mark and the Giving Public Access Television that we're all <laughs> thanking for. So stay warm, have a great day.